Okay. So I think you can you, you you can start. So first of all, I would like to thank the uh, the participation of Professor uh, Carlos Alberto Simi from Federal University of Minas Gerais, and Dr. David Garcia Cava from the University of Edinburgh, uh, to be a member jury of the master dissertation of Jesse Paixão. The title of this dissertation is Damage Quantification Laminate Composite Using Gaussian Process Regression Model. Um, first of all, uh, Jesse has uh, 50 minutes, uh, one hour um, almost, to present his work. And after, you can uh, ask some questions and so some discussion about uh, his presentation. So that's nice. Thank you very much for your participation. Jesse, it's with you. Oh, thank you, Professor. Can you hear me well? It's okay, the volume? Yes. Okay. I will share Perfect. my screen. Uh, okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, then I will start now. Oh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure today to defend my dissertation. Uh, the title of my dissertation is Damage Quantification in Laminated Compost Using Gaussian Process Regression Model. First, I would like to thank you, my advisor, Professor Samuel da Silva, and also the committee members, Professor Carlos Simin and Professor David Garcia, and also uh, my friends and family who are watching this presentation. I divided this presentation in five main topics. I will start with the introduction and the objective of this work. Then I will present uh, the damage quantification methodology based on Gaussian process regression model using Lambda wave based damage indices. After that, I will present the experimental application of this methodology. In the fourth topic, I will present a modified version of the methodology for damage quantification and wind turbine blades using vibration-based damage indices. And finally, I will conclude with some final remarks. Well, composite materials present a stiffness to mass ratio, very appealing for engineering applications, because you can achieve mechanical properties uh, better or comparable with the standard materials like steels, but with a reduced mass. The first industrial sector to employ composite materials was the aerospace industry. But presently, other sectors like uh, renewable energy, agriculture, and automobiles uh, employ too. Despite all the benefits of this material, they are very complex and they, they present numerous mechanisms of failure, like in matrix cracking, the lamination, the bonding, and etc., which makes it difficult to guarantee a high reliability in service. Then, in this context, it has been proposed in the literature the application of structural health monitoring techniques in order to improve uh, the safety and the reliability of structures made uh, with composites uh, in serves. Well, basically, structural health monitoring techniques can be divided in four main levels according to their objective. Uh, the first level is damage detection, the second, is damage localization. The third is damage quantification, which will be the focus of this work. And the last, the prognosis. Um, <clears throat> according to Figueiredo, uh, almost uh, all structural health monitoring techniques can be cast into the statistical pattern recognition paradigm for SHN, illustrated here in this figure, which divides uh, the SHM technique into a four-step process. The first step is the operation evaluation, where we evaluate the structure and the operational conditions and the type of damage that we are interested in. The second step is the data acquisition, where we define the type of data that we acquire from the structure. The third and fourth step will be the focus of this work. The third step is the feature extraction, where we apply some technique to strive to extract some feature related with the presence of damage in the structure. And the last step is the statistical modeling for feature classification or quantification in our case. 
In order to step forward to the damage quantification level, there are two uh, key challenges that should be addressed. Uh, the first one is how to relate a damage index extracted from data uh, with the damage severed. As it is very difficult to establish a mathematical physical model for um, composite materials in order to uh, establish a relationship between these two variables, uh, an approach data-driven seems suitable. Uh, another problem is the inherent uncertainties associated with the damage index. Uh, for example, related with the temperature variation, source, sensor placement, and etc. In this context, the application of Gaussian process regression model, which is a, ve a very powerful stochastic model, seems very suitable because we can, we can address the two problems. Uh, to we can establish a relationship between our damage index and damage severity by a regression model. And also we can take into account the uncertainty because it is a stochastic model. In this work, we propose two problem statements. The primary problem statement is illustrated here. And we're supposed to have a compost plate, a laminate compost plate, instrumented with a PZT network, used to excite and to acquire data from the lump wave propagation. Then we are, we are interested here uh, in the delamination detection and delamination quantification in a hotspot region. In the secondary problem, we we supposed to have a wind turbine blade instrumented with uh, uh, accelerometer sensors and an actuator to generate an impact into the structure. In this case, we are interested into the debonding detection and debonding uh, quantification. The objective of this research project is to propose and validate an SATM methodology for damage quantification in laminated compost based on the application of Gaussian process regression model. It's important to remember that in both cases here, we have a problem of hotspot monitoring where we know a priori the damage localization. Then I will present now the damage quantification methodology using lamp wave based damage indices. In this case, we are interested in the primary problem statement where we're interested in in the delamination detection and quantification uh, using lamp wave signals. The methodology that will be proposed here is based on the supervised learning. Then it has to be implemented in, in a two steps. The first step is the training, and the second is the test step. Then uh, the procedure is illustrated here based on the statistical pattern paradigm. Then we propose here. Uh, for the feature extraction from, from the lamp wave signals, um, the application of autoregressive models in order to extract some statistical features related with the damage. In the statistical model, we propose to apply a damage index based on the Mahalanobis square distance for outlier detection that we can use for delamination detection. And in the second step, we propose the application of the Gaussian process regression model in order to establish a relationship between our damage index and the delamination size. <clears throat> the application of the autoregressive model has been extensively used in the literature uh, for damage detection using vibration-based indices. However, it has been little explored for lamp wave-based uh, data. Basically, uh, uh, suppose that we have a time series signal Y with N sample, uh, which in this case is our lamp wave propagation, uh, propagation signal, then an AR model can be identified using the structure presented in this equation, where we express each sample of our signal has a linear combination of p pass samples um, of our signal, and also a residual error. This is called an autoregressive model, where we have the autoregressive coefficients AI and also our residual error. The AR model identification is performed using uh, least squares method, and it's a well-established method in the literature. And the problem here is how to select an appropriate model warrior because it's a prior unknown. Uh, we propose in this work the application of 
the Bayesian information criterion, which is represented in this equation. Uh, basically, this criterion uh, gives a trade-off between the goodness of fit of a model identified with a model order P and the model order complexity. The first term of this criterion uh, is related with the goodness of fit associated with the variance of the residual error. And the second term is related with the model complexity, which is related with the number of coefficients in our identified model. Then the best model order is that one that minimizes this criterion. Then we use this criterion to select the model order of our auto regressive model. Basically, there are two approaches to be used. Uh, there, there are two approaches to be used um, uh, for damage feature extraction um, from our auto regressive model. The first approach is based on the residual error, the second is based on the coefficients. Uh, basically, this is made under the assumption that the damage introduced change in, our, in the structural response and consequently in our acquired signal that will affect the, the autoregressive model identification. Uh, in this case, the model order is defined based on the structure into the uh, baseline or health condition or reference condition. Here we have an example, for example, a signal acquired from the lambda wave propagation and uh, we're supposed to identify a model with uh, model order four. Then we have a coefficient vector with four coefficients and a coefficient vector of the residual errors. Then if you identify a new signal under a different condition, for example, with a damage that will change this signal, uh, this change will be reflected into the coefficient vector and also in, into the residuals. Uh, the problem here is how to detect this chance. For this, it's necessary to define uh, some statistical feature. In this work, we propose three statistical features, statistical measures. In this case, the X1, which is our feature based on the residual errors, which is given by the variance of the residual error into the actual condition divided by the variance of the residual error into the reference condition. And the second X2, is given by the variance of our, res uh, our vector of coefficients from the identified AR model into the actual condition divided by the variance of the coefficient vector from the model identified into the baseline or reference condition. Uh, in order to capture the information from these two features, we propose the application of Mahalanob squared distance uh, as a local damage index. Mahalanobis square distance is commonly used in SHM uh, to compute the distance between distributions in a multivariate space. In this case, we have a bivariate space because we, we have two features. Uh, the Mahalanobis is given by this equation here. Uh, this is a supervised algorithm that has to be uh, trained. We have to establish a reference condition and we have to extract the mean and the covariance function of this reference condition. After that, we can compute the distance from any other point into the multivariate space. In this case, for example, if uh, uh, the problem is illustrated here, we have a bivariate space and we have a reference, con reference distribution represented by the blue points here. Uh, we will compute the mean and the covariance matrix of this distribution. After that, we can implement this equation to compute uh, the Mahalanob square distance uh, to any other point in this in this space. It's important to remember that this is a local damage index, which is computed for uh, the data acquired from each sensor in our structure. Uh, as in, in the primary problem statement, we're supposed to have a number of paths uh, given by the number of uh, sensors n we propose to merge all the information extracted uh, by the local damage indices into a global damage index defined as follows. Uh, the DI is defined as the mean of um, our local damage index proposed before. And we use this damage index 
to perform the damage detection based on the outlier detection, where the threshold value is defined and has the most significant value of the damage index on the baseline condition in the training step. Uh, well, the problem of damage quantification is illustrated here in this figure. Basically, we want to establish a relationship between our damage index and our damage severity in order to quantify it. We can perform that using a meta model. In this case, the Gaussian process regression model. This problem can be written uh, as a non-linear regression model given in this equation here, where we have has output our delamination area, and we have has input our damage index, and we have a function f which is unknown, and also a residual error that cannot be explained by this function here. Um, as I said, th this methodology is based on the supervised learning. Then we're supposed to have a, a data set to train our model. And this data set is represented here um, by this, this equation here. Then we have has a data set. We have the, our global damage index and also the delamination area measured in each test condition, which is represented by X and S. The function f is assumed uh, a priori has a Gaussian multivariate distribution. Here is the difference of the application of the Gaussian process regression model. We will approximate our function f has a Gaussian multivariate distribution with zero mean and the following covariance matrix. Here we're supposed to have a zero mean uh, just for a simplify the mathematical formulation, but any other trend could be adopted here. And the problem here is how to select an appropriate uh, covariance function or how to define this covariance function that will describe uh, our prior distribution given by the data set of training. In this work, uh, we propose the application of the covariance function of the family exponential, which is represented by this equation here. Each element of our covariance matrix will be given by, by this equation, where we have has hyperparameters the variance of our function f and also the length scale w. Uh, just a second, can you hear? Yes. Yes, uh, yes, yes, we can. I, I would just, uh, I have a problem with the trans transmission in YouTube. I will just do I something. There is some problem with the uh, YouTube. Yeah, uh, it's it's okay now. I, I just allow this sound. Yes, I, I hear clearly. Uh, okay, I will I will start again. Uh, and uh, sorry, as I said, uh, we can approximate our function f has a multivari Gaussian multivariate distribution, and. Um, the advantage of considering a Gaussian multivariate distribution is that we, you know how to work with, with this kind of distribution. And we can write the prior, uh, the likelihood function of the prior distribution like this. And from this equation, we can also describe the log marginal likelihood function depending on the hyperparameter, which is given by this equation here and then from this equation and the prior distribution, we can find the hyperparameters of our covariance function. Then uh, this this can, this can be performed by using an optimization algorithm using the gradient based method, which in this work is performed using the UK Lab framework, which is a framework used in MATLAB for stochastic model. And then once the hyperparameters are computed, the model can be used for prediction uh, using Bayesian inference because uh, we can uh, predict the posterior distribution of our data for a new input, for example, X asterisks, um, that will be normal also, will be Gaussian, and it will be given by this equation. Then we can use this to predict, to interpolate our model. The problem is illustrated here, uh, where we have has input our damage index and also 
our delamination area has input. Then the objective here is to use this framework of the Gaussian process regression model to train uh, our model in order to establish the relationship between the two variables, variables and also to take into account the uncertainties associated with the damage index. Well, in this figure, we have the description of the methodology, which is divided in two steps, the training step and the test step. In the training step, we have to collect data from our structure uh, in the baseline condition, in a health condition. And we have to collect data also from progressive damage conditions of our structure. Then we start this step by selecting the model order using the Bayesian information criteria. After that, we identify an AMR model for each acquired signal from the progressive and from the health conditions. Then we extract the damage features and compute the, dam the global damage index. This global damage index will be used to train our Gaussian process regression model uh, with the delamination area measured into the progressive damage condition. And after training this model, we can use this into a test step where we're supposed to have our structure into a union condition that we want to monitor. Then we will just collect data from this structure. We identify an AR model for each signal. We will compute the damage index and we will classify the structural state by performing the outlier detection. If damage is detected, then we use this damage index to estimate the delamination area uh, using the Gaussian process regression model training. Uh, now we present the experimental applications proposed in this work. Uh, we propose two application cases to demonstrate uh, this methodology. The first was performed here at UNESP and the second is a data set provided by NASA. Uh, in the case one, we have a composite coupon. It's a plate with a new directional layup of 10 layers uh, presented in this, in this figure. We instrumented this plate with four PZTs. We used the PZT1 as actuator and an input signal of five cycles, sinusoidal turn burst of 250 kilohertz. And we used the PZT3, 4, uh, uh, two, three, and four for acquisition at a sampling frequency of five megahertz. And the experiment was performed inside a thermal chamber and damage was introduced between PZT1 and PZT2 in this region here. Here present the structural condition simulated. Then the damage was simulated by uh, bonding an industrial putty between the PZT1 and 2, and the progressive damage conditions were simulated by increasing the area covered by this uh, putty. Then we performed the experiments uh, under a variation of temperature from 0 degrees Celsius to 6 degrees Celsius into the health condition, and the reference temperature was used as 30 degrees Celsius. Here we have ten, uh, 11 damage conditions varying from less than 0 0.2% uh, to almost 2.5% uh, of the lamination area. Here, the delamination area is given as a um, percentage of the total area of the plate. In the second case, uh, we, uh, we have four coupons with this following layup is a symmetric layup. And this, provi this data set is provided by NAS. Is an open source repository that can be used. And each one of these coupons was submitted to a fatigue test performed on an MTS machine. And also they were they were instrumented with two pads of PZTs. The first patch with six PZTs was used as actuator, and the second pad uh, with six PZTs was used as sensor to acquire the data at the acquisition frequency of 12 megahertz. And the input signal here was uh, at the same central frequency and also uh, with 50 volts of amplitude. Here is the geometry of our coupon where it can be noted the presence of a stress concentrator like here, uh, here in order to guarantee that the delamination will initiate at this region. In this case, the delamination 
uh, was captured by the X-ray image performed along the uh, fatigue test. Then they stopped the test and they performed the X-ray image test and they provided the image. Uh, here we have an example of image. And then we used a software, an open source software for image processing uh, to measure the delamination area, which is represented uh, here. It's important to remember that in this case, the X-ray image test was performed uh, under free free boundary condition. Here we have all the structure conditions um, performed. Then we have four coupons, L1, S11, L1, S12, L1, S18, and L1, S19, uh, with a maximum of nine damage conditions, varying from almost 0 0.2% to almost 7%. Here we have an example of measured signals in both application cases. In the application case one, we have simulated damage and we have a comparison between the signal acquired into the health condition and to the damage condition at 30 degrees Celsius. And we can note that there is an attenuation to the lambda wave propagation mode here. And in the second case, uh, where we have a real case of delamination induced by fatigue, uh, we can notice the similar effect of attenuation, but there is also a, a delay between the reference signal to the health condition and the damage condition seven. Well, the first step of the methodology implementation was to identify the model order using the Bayesian information criteria. Uh, then, based on this criteria, we selected the model order, a model order of 18 for case one and model order of 16 for case two. Then we identify uh, the AR, uh, an AR model for each signal acquired based on this model order. And here we present an example of the results obtained for the predicted model represented by the dashed red line and the measured uh, signal represented by the blue line here. We can see that the signals fit very well. And in order to validate our AR model identification, we use a witness test validation with 950% um, of confidence. And as we can see here in, the, in this graph, which represents the autocorrelation function of a residual error, uh, the residual error can be classified as a, a Gaussian noise, which is, um, which is an indicative that they are, the AR model was adequately identified. Uh, in this figure, we present the space of features obtained from the signals acquired between the PZT1 and 2. In this case, we have the lambda wave propagation crossing the damage. And we can compare the effects of damage and temperature variation. We have here the cluster of points represented by the blue points of the health condition at 30 degrees Celsius. And we can see uh, an a pattern caused by the temperature variation that moves these uh, the features uh, to the right now, represented by the orange and uh, green points. And we can see that the damage condition uh, causes uh, a different change into the space of features. It moves the features to the left down, as can be observed here and these patterns are used to has a, an indicative of damage if you compare for example uh, the space of features from uh, from the data acquired from uh, the lambda wave propagation between pzt1 and 3 we can note that it's very very hard to distinguish be between the damage condition and the health conditions because in this case the lambda wave propagation is not interacting with the damage then as we can see, it's depending on the damage localization. It was observed a similar pattern for the case two. In this case, we have a path crossing the damaged region. And we can see that again, the damage features move to the left now according to the damage uh, severed. If you look into a path not crossing the damage, we notice that this pattern is less pronounced. Then 
After I compute the Mahalan average square distance with the local damage index for each sensor, we computed the global damage index, which is represented here um, in this graph. Uh, for each delamination, delamination area me measured, then we can see that there is a trend between the damage index and also the delamination area in percentage. Uh, we can see that as we increase the delamination area, uh, there is an increase into the damage index also. And also, there is a variation in each condition. The objective here is use this data to train our Gaussian process regression model. We observed a similar pattern uh, for the coupon L1 S11 in the case two. And here we present the results obtained for the GPR model training using uh, application case one, data from the application case one. We used the has training data. The following conditions represented by the blue points and we use it as test conditions, the three conditions uh, represented by the red points. And here in this graph, we have the mean of the trained Gaussian process regression model represented by the black line, and also the confidence interval considering uh, three uh, sigma of our model represented by the dashed uh, lines. In this case, you can see that the model could capture the trend between the damage index and the delamination area and also takes into account the uncertainty uh, where we can, do, we can observe that almost all data were inside the confidence interval of three sigma. In the case two, uh, we observed that the model was able to capture again the trend between the damage index and the delamination area. But in this case, it's important to remember that we, we trained our model using three different coupons, L1 S18, 19, L1 S 18 and L1 S12. And we test with the L1 S11. In this case, uh, we have a more complex case because it involves more source of uncertainty because we are training in different structures. Even if they are nominally identical, there are some variations into the process, procedure of fabrication and also sensor placement. And even in this case, which involves more source of uncertainty, the model was able to capture the trend and also the, the uncertainty associated with the damage index. The GPR model prediction performance can be better evaluated in these graphs, where we have the measured delamination area represented here by the estimated delamination area with the GPR model for the test conditions. Here in this case, we have the results obtained for application case one, where it can be observed that the uh, prediction, the estimation of the delamination are converged for the this diagonal line, which represents an optimal uh, performance where the measured um, delamination area is the same that the those estimated by the GPR model. And we have in this case a root mean square error of 0 0.15. If we compare with the application case two, we observe a larger variation from this diagonal line in this case which is represented by the higher uh, root mean squared error of 0 0.56. Um, but in an acceptable level, in this case, for example, we could predict, estimate um, the delamination area of the coupon L1S11 using just the training data from uh, three other different coupons, which is a very interesting result. Uh, now I will present the modified version of the methodology for damage quantification in wind turbine blades using vibration-based damage indices. Uh, this part of this work was motivated by the work published by Professor David Garcia uh, in 2009, where he proposed a data-driven vibration uh, strategy for damage detection in wind turbine blades. The methodology is based on singular spectrum analysis, and on that paper, they presented a study of damage detection performance uh, in a SSP 34 meters wind turbine blade. One interesting conclusion on this work is that the damage indices proposed are well correlated with the damage severity. Then, based on this conclusion, we decide to explore. Uh, the application of the Gaussian process regression model in order to uh, step forward to the damage quantification level. This is illustrated in the, in the secondary problem statement where I have a, uh, 
a wind turbine blade instrumented with some sensors and an actuator, and we are interested into the debounding detection, which was already performed by Professor David Garcia with his methodology. And in this case, we are interested into the debounding size estimation using the Gaussian process regression model, which the contribution, our contribution uh, in this work. Then the methodology proposed by Professor David, Gar David Garcia is illustrated here, and it consists of four steps. In the first step, the data collection, we will start by collecting the data, the accelerometer data from the wind turbine blades, and we have to transfer them from the time uh, domain to the frequency domain. And we start all the data into a matrix X, and we're supposed to have uh, M realizations uh, to acquire in numerous data from the same, from the different conditions, and we will start all in this X matrix. This X matrix will contain a uh, number of M realization signals. Then the second step is the creation of the reference state, where you take just the signals acquired from the health condition or the health reference condition, and to create the, the, the reference state. In this case, we start by creating um, an embedded matrix from this X matrix of each element, where you create a, a, a embedded matrix with uh, W uh, legged cups of our signal, which is represented by this matrix. And for each element of our matrix X, and then we obtain a X hat matrix. Then we just make the decomposition of this matrix in order to extract the principal components of our data that we use to project our data. Then after that, we select just some of the principal components in order to reconstruct our signal, represented by this equation here. And then we have a reconstructed signal using the most relevant uh, principal components that will be used in the third step, the feature extraction, where you compare each measured signal with each component of our reconstructed signal represented by this equation. Then, for example, if we select five principal components, then we have a feature vector uh, of five components, compare each measured signal with each component of the reconstructed signal. The feature vector is represented here by T and is used in the decision-making step to compute the local damage index proposed by Professor Dave, which is based on the Mahalanobis distance. And again, here we have to train uh, the Mahalanobis distance for a reference condition com by computing the mean of uh, the distribution of this reference condition and also the covariance matrix. After that, we can perform the damage detection by an, a hypothesis testing. Um, well, this is a local damage index that it has to be computed for each sensor uh, of our structure. Then, in order to apply the Gaussian process regression framework, we propose uh, to transform this, this local damage index into a global damage index, which can capture the information from all local damage index, uh, has a unique damage in indicator. Uh, this simplifies the process of the Gaussian process regression model training, because if not, it was necessary to train a GPR model for each sensor. In this case, we have the global damage index uh, has a mean of all the local damage index indices computed based on the methodology proposed by Professor David Garcia. And again, the problem of damage can, quantification can be posed as a problem, as a nonlinear regression model as proposed before, where we have has output our the, our debounding size in this case, which is our damage severed, and has input our global damage index. Then we can, can apply the same framework proposed into the main methodology by just changing the, the type of damage index uh, computed. Then in this flowchart, we have um, the modified version of the methodology, which is highlighted by the red lines. The, this region right highlighted here is the methodology pro proposed by Professor Dave Garcia, and here is the modification proposed by us. And the training step, we have to collect the data from the wind turbine blade into the reference condition, 
and also for a progressive damage condition. Uh, then we implement the methodology proposed by Professor David Garcia in order to extract the damage index and to compute the global damage index. And we use this to train our Gaussian cross regression model using this global damage index has input and the damage size measured has output. After training our model, we use this model into the test step where you're supposed to have a wind turbine blades into a unknown damage condition. Then we collect data from this structure. We will compute the feature vector into the feature extraction step. We compute the local and the global damage index, and we classify this structure. If there is damage into the structure, then we use this global damage index to estimate the damage size, which in this case is the debounding size. In this work, we propose the application to the same data set uh, used by Professor David Garcia, um, which is a wind turbine blade of 34 mean meters manufactured by SSP Technologies AS. And the, this structure was instrumented with 23 axle accelerometers uh, positioned into the trailing edge and also into the letting edge. And uh, also, uh, it, it was instrumented with uh, an actuator to generate an impact into the structure. The actuator was positioned in two different positions, A4, A3, A2, and A1. And the damage was simulated here by the debonding of the trading edge between the sensors 5 and 6. Uh, here we have an illustration of the wind turbine blades instrumented with the accelerometers and also with the actual electromechanical actuator, which is illustrated here in this figure, in this photo. This was used to generate the impact into the structure. Then the progressive damage condition was simulated by the procedure illustrated in this figure, uh, where they removed the adhesive between the two surfaces of the wind turbine blade in order to simulate the debonding, but they replaced the adhesive between the surface uh, by, uh, by thin plates. And also they introduced some bolts into the structure. Like that, they could simulate the health condition by tightening all the bolts. Then they also could control this debonding size by losing uh, a defined number of both boats. Then they simulated that the bond with increasing size varying from uh, 20 centimeters to 100 centimeters, which is illustrated is presented in this table here. And they acquired multiple signals for each condition, which is presented here. In total, 386 signals were acquired from this structure, which was used to damage detection and also damage quantification. Here we have an example of um, acquired signal by the accelerometer one into the trading edge and considering the actuator position A1 represented by the blue lines. This is the uh, signal into the frequency domain and the measured signal and also we present here the reconstructed signal using five principal components of our signal represented by the red line. As you can see, the reconstructed signal is, is more is smooth than the measured signal. And this reconstructed signal is used to compute our feature vector. Um, then in this figure, we have the local damage indices computed and also the, the bonding size um, for each sensor, according to the methodology proposed by Professor David. As you can see, the damage sensitivity depends uh, on the sensor position. For example, sensor seven and sensor eight are much more sensitive to the presence of damage, uh, as can be noted by the difference between the damage index into the health condition represented by the blue points and the points into the damage conditions represented by the red points. In this case, they are more sensitive when compared, for example, with sensors five and sensor six. And in this case, we are considering the actuator at position A1. We have the same graph for actuator at position A2, and we can see a difference. In this case, it seems that uh, the overall performance uh, is lower for the, uh, regarding to the 
damage sensitive because uh, in some cases it's, it's difficult to distinguish between the health and the damage conditions. And the, uh, for the actuator at position A3, it, we have a similar um, as observed in the actuator position A2. And for actuator at position A4, we can note that um, there are some sensors that present a higher sensitivity to, to the presence of damage. And also we can note a more uh, pronounced trend between the uh, damage index and also our debonding size, for example, in, in this sensor too. Uh, then based on this uh, local damage index, we computed the global damage index proposed. And we also trained the Gaussian process regression model. In this case, we have the results obtained for uh, the training. In here we have the um, mean of the Gaussian process regression model represented by the black line and the confidence interval of 950% of co confidence uh, represented by the gray, gray, uh, gray region. And also we have the uh, points used for training, which which are the blue points, and also the uh, conditions used for tests, which are represented by the red points. In this case, we can see that the GPR model was able to capture the trend between uh, the damage index and also the, the bonding size in this case uh, for both uh, uh, actuator position A1 and A2. And it, it can be noted that the actuator at position A2 presents a more pronounced trend between the damage indicator and also the debonding size. If you compare with the actuator at position A3 and A4, we note some difference also uh, regarding to the trend between the damage index and the denomination, the, the bonding size. And again, the model was able to capture the trend and also the, the uncertainties associated with the damage index in its condition. In order to evaluate the GPR prediction performance, again, we present uh, the graph of the measured debonding size represented here by the estimated debonding size using the GPR model for test conditions. Um, here we present for the actuator at position A1, where you can see that the estimation of the debonding size, there is a convergence for this diagonal line and it's normal to have some deviations because we have a small population of data, but it's in this case, we have an acceptable level. Um, for actuator position at A2, we can note that a larger variation, uh, deviation from this diagonal line, which represents the optimal performance. And this is reflected into the root mean squared error computed. We can see that the actuator position A1 presents a lower uh, root mean squared error if compared with the actuator position A2. Uh, if we compare with the actuator position A, A3 and A4, we note that the lowest root mean squared error is noted for the actuator at position A4. And then it should be the better uh, actuator position to perform the uh, damage quantification. In this case, it's important to remember that in this application case, we trained in the same structures, in the same structure, and also that there is a low number of conditions to train and also uh, a low number of data. But even in this situation, uh, the GPR model could capture out the trend and the uncertainty uh, the uncertainties associated with the damage index. Uh, finally, I would like to present some final remarks. Uh, then we proposed in this work a damage quantification methodology based on the application of Gaussian process regression model. And also we demonstrated experimentally the application in different scenarios. The first one was for the elimination detection using lumb wave based damage signals. And the second, for the bonding size uh, quantification uh, using vibration-based damage indices. Well, the damage feature extraction techniques uh, based on the autoregressive model present into the main methodology present an adequate sensitivity to the presence of the elimination and a direct color correlation uh, with the damage area. Our thought autoregressive model uh, 
has been extensively applied for uh, vibration data, it has not been explored for lamp wave signals. Then this is one of, of the contributions of this work. And we demonstrated that it could be used for damage detection and damage quantification. Uh, the results found in both application cases uh, confirmed that the GPR model is useful to estimate the delamination size by stochastic interpolation in identical and nominally identical structures uh, through the damage index indices extracted from lamp wave signals. And then we demonstrated in two cases, one where it trained uh, with the same structure and another one where it trained with different structure which is more, uh, much more challenging uh, because it involves more source of uncertainty. Uh, the application of the GPR model uh, to establish uh, the relationship between the damage index and the damage severity demonstrated to be able to capture the trend and the, the uncertainties adequately. And finally, the methodology for damage quantification uh, is versatile and can be extended for different damage indices and types of damage according to uh, uh, your requirement. Then it can be applied with, has demonstrated with vibration-based signals and also with lamp wave-based damage indices. Uh, here's some suge suggestions for future works. Then one suggestion is to introduce an, a strategy for training using data from finite element method for model, for example, because in some cases it's impossible or very expensive to obtain data from progressive damage conditions into a structure, a first structure. And also the use of transfer learning algorithms to reduce the damage index for a bit in the training step with different coupons. Uh, because uh, when we trained our model using different coupons, we know uh, a high variability between the damage index extracted from one structure to another one. And it could be reduced by using uh, transfer learning algorithms. Also to study the application of free and relative free baseline strategy for damage feature extraction. Uh, because uh, for lamp wave propagation signals, you, you have a uh, high influence of, um, a strong influence of operational and environmental conditions, then change into the temperature and also into the operational conditions can um, affect your damage feature extraction procedure. A relative or free baseline could improve that. And the last suggestion is to apply poly polynomial chaos Krigan model, which is a more powerful stochastic model to improve the accuracy of the stochastic interpolation. I would like to thank you, uh, FAPESP, CNPQ, uh, UNESP, CAPES, and GMC for the financial support. Uh, thank you for your attention. Okay. So, <clears throat> thank you, Jesse, for your talk. Now you could begin uh, the sequence of comments and questions to be performed to the member jury. Again, I appreciate the participation of Professor Simini and Dr. Cava in his member jury to evaluate Jesse Paixão. And I would like to invite Dr. David to hear your opinion and cares about the work of Jesse. Thank you. It's... Hi, thank you. Thank you very much, Samuel. Um, and thank you very much, uh, Jesse, for your very good presentation. I think. Um, it covered very well all the steps of your work and it was very nice to see and actually through your presentation you clarify some of my questions that I was having for you. Um, you know I, I don't have familiarity with the system and the Brazilian system but uh, the thing I will try to do is to to ask you some more generic questions or more technical questions just to evaluate uh, that the knowledge that you acquired in your master thesis and also to to learn from from you uh, things that maybe I don't I don't know, but uh, just to to make sure that we're gonna have a very very nice discussion uh, into that. So you should be relaxed because you did a very excellent job. Okay. Um, so as you explained before during the presentation, 
SHM is very popular, right? Uh, it's getting very popularity because we want to have control of the of the structures in this particular case before they collapse. And there is this terminology that people start to use about uh, smart structures or intelligent structures of self diagnosis structures or all these concepts how how you will based on your on your literature review how you will place uh, how you can identify what what is, what is an intelligent structure can you explain that in a general aspect what is an intelligent structure or smart structure or something how will be the futuristic implication of this uh. Uh, in my opinion, a, a smart structure is a structure where that can uh, identify, a, where you can identify a damage and also use this information to um, to, to counter, for example, uh, in the, the main objective into the aerospace, for example, is to apply this kind of uh, techniques to identify damage uh, into a flight, for example, but we should think beyond that. For example, if you identify damage, um, we could, for example, to implement some techniques to provide the robustness to our structure to, um, how, to how to say that, um, to keep it running. And or if it's not possible, we have to we have to know based on the information that we have. If you uh, you you can stop the structure, for example. Um, yeah, is that? Do you think that this kind of uh, techniques will have implications in the economical costs of the structures, for instance? Ah, yes, sure, because it can improve, for example, the, um, uh, the it can reduce the maintenance cost of a structure because you can operate your structure uh, at the maximum level. Uh, of its performance. For example, you can you you not stop your structure until you you don't need to do that. Then you can uh, perform better. You can work better with your structure, and you to be reflected into the costs. Yeah, very good, very good. Uh, okay, so um, then you also mentioned that uh, during the, the methods that uh, there are different ways of applying that and used to use the statistical approach, which is well known in the in the literature. Um, but you were mentioning about supervised and unsupervised methods. Uh, mm. could, you, could you explain a bit what means supervised and supervised method and how this implies for you for your work? Is your work supervised or unsupervised? or within your methods, there are parts which are supervised or semi-supervised and supervised. Could you comment on this? Yeah, in our case, we have a supervised method because it requires data uh, from our structure into the health and into the damage conditions. Then we use this data to train our model. And after that, we will apply into a similar uh, situation. And this have some uh, advantages. It's it's simply it's more simple to do that when you have data to train and after to apply but the problem here is as i said in some cases it's impossible to to obtain this kind of data uh, in the case of the compost coupon it's feasible to train uh, our model and test after that but for example if you think about a, um, a den or a, an airplane or um, for example, a bridge, it's impossible. Then uh, there are some methods based on super unsupervised uh, learning where we can uh, detect our damage uh, without uh, knowing data, for example, from damaged conditions. But after some research into the literature, most of this kind of data is just uh, focused on the damage detection level because it's really hard to how how to establish a, a, a relationship between a damage index extracted from a statistical uh, statistical methodology with the damage severed without having uh, any kind of data of the damage conditions and um, then in my opinion uh, uh, maybe we could improve for example um, 
the damage detection level by applying some unsupervised learning. But for the damage detection, the damage quantification level, it's, it requires the uh, supervised technique or maybe a semi-supervised technique by combining the two, the two cases. But, yeah. So there is, there is a lot of very good answer. I, I like it. Um, you did really good. But there is a bit, uh, you know, discussion uh, uh, in, the, in the community of uh, mechanical engineers, mainly for applying the supervised and supervised. Um, when we consider only healthy data from to, to create or reference states, let's say, how, how is your vision on that? Is this considered to be supervised or unsupervised? What you would say, or semi-supervised, so I don't know. There is no clear answer. There are people who call it supervised, other people are semi-supervised. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that uh, when, when you have just data from your health, health conditions, uh, I think that this is a, an uns, an unsupervised way to, to do that. Um, uh, yeah, this is yeah. my opinion. Then, then in your case, you will say that your method combines both, right? Because the damage indices are calculated by an unsupervised method because you just make the reference based on your healthy structure. In my, in and, my then, case, and then okay. you will use the information from the damage to fit your Gaussian process regression model. So you mm -hmm. have a combination of both, which is excellent. I, I don't say this is wrong, but it's just to, to actually highlight even better the contribution that you are doing, mm -hmm. that you are using the both techniques following your discussion or you, you kind of thoughts or rational behind it. Would you agree with me or you think is it's not the case. Yeah, no, because in my case, it, I, I'm using data from health and damage condition. I see that just like a supervised learning. Um, but for instance, uh, in the in, when you use the methodology proposed in my paper, the damage indices that you calculated are only used healthy, only use healthy to create a reference. Ah, and then yeah, when you have yeah. all the damages plotted in the, they say the control chart, yeah. you use this information to fit your uh, function, let's say, to to predict the severity or quantify the damage. Yeah. So it's at two levels, right? Um, yeah. <clears throat> of analysis, which is, is good. Yeah. It's just to say I that you can maybe reconsider that. Uh, in when yeah. you write you because I think you did the same thing with the plates, uh, with the land waves. You just choose the healthy data to compute the yeah. damage in six and then you just feed the model to count quantify yeah. the damage. Yeah, um, I can I can think more about that and maybe include some discussion into the into the final thirty. Uh, I think it's it's, re it's really good what you did. Uh, it's just up up, up to you. Uh, um, okay. And this, uh, Samuel, I, I don't know if I don't familiar. So you think it's better if I car I have another three or four questions? You think is? Uh, I think you you are free to comments uh, to perform our comments. Uh, you can uh, ask Jessé, for example, for some technical detail. Yes. Or, yes. or if you have some uh, suggestion in the PDF, the test. You can send it him. Yes. So the idea is to evaluate the, the, the work yes. in the general. But form. my question is, I should carry on, or I should uh, allow Carlos to contribute as well, or I just finish myself and then he will carry on. I think you are. Uh, we are open to discuss it. For example, if you, if you, I, Carlos, Professor Carlos, start to to give your comments, if you. If you would like to complement some points, I think we're we're open. I think okay. we yeah, are yeah. All, we are only in France here. On. I guess you can go on, and then if I okay. have some things to do, and then we do it together. Then we okay. save some time. Okay. Okay. Bye. Perfect. Perfect. So, sorry for that. Uh, it's no, just, okay. okay. It's fine. Okay. <clears throat> so then, I will go for maybe another question. The other question is: You use autoregressive uh, modeling to to extract, let's say, the features from your land wave signals. 
Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you are familiar that, <coughs> excuse me, there are many uh, kinds of autoregressive modeling. There is one which yeah. is autoregressive modeling, another one which is moving average, another one which is exogenous. Yeah. Why, why autoregressive model and not the other ones? What you will say? Ah, what what yeah. is the decision? This is an interesting question. Uh, when I start this work, my objective was to study the damage feature extraction using autoregressive model, different kinds of autoregressive model. Then we started by applying different kinds. Uh, we tried the ARX model and other kinds of autoregressive models. And we found out that the autoregressive model, uh, the AR model in your simplest way, uh, performed uh, better than, than the other ones. And also there is an advantage because this model is very simple. And for example, there are some works into the literature that demonstrates the applicability into uh, uh, with the hardware for the real time monitoring. Then we decide to use this this autoregressive model because of that. Uh, I, I did not include an analysis on on my dissertation, uh, a comparison between these two between these mad models because. Uh, Along the development of the dissertation, we decided to use uh, the AR model for these reasons. And then, uh, yeah, it's okay. for that. We published okay. Okay. Professor. If you permit me. Yeah, yeah. Yes, if you permit me, I can complement uh, the GSET. That is a good question. Uh, in the initial, uh, our main idea, our key idea about this work is to perform a, a regression uh, interpolation between the coefficients of this model in several conditions. So, uh, our idea it was try, we performed some, some tests with this. Uh, I will publish a, a, a paper now uh, with Jesse and with me, my colleagues in, in French uh, about this idea to perform a cubic spline in the coefficients to try to identify the to extrapolate to another situations that's one one initial idea so our idea is to try with this coefficient with this coefficient change to try understand the law a damage about the the law progression how the the the, the damage can progress that's a really hard thing to do with yes. the real damage uh in, in, there is several uncertainties about this in the middle of this work, we decided to use the Gaussian process because we think it's better to do this in, a, in the best way. It's, it's for this that we use uh, the methodology using ARMA index, use auto receive index. But uh, for this, to use it, any index. The main idea of, I think, it, of GSL works is to have a damage index and the size of damage or, or, or level of severity and to try to perform a learning procedure to try to obtain this law of, of using Gaussian mm -hmm. process. That's why I think this is the main, main idea. Yeah. Only to complement, okay. sorry. Yeah, 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 no, it's fine, it's fine. Uh, also into the outer regressive modeling, when you just obtain the coefficients, uh, it might happen that depending on the complexity of the signal that you want to model, you will, you might have more or less coefficients. Um, I, uh, do you do you face any problem with that, or do you have the same number of uh, coefficients to perform your feature vector? I don't know if you understand my question. Mm, yeah. Uh, to, to decide the the model order, the number of coefficients. This is. Uh, a good question when you work with uh, autoregressive models. Uh, I, I'll, share, I'll share my screen. Mm -hmm. the, the model order choice is a very, very interesting question when you work with autoregressive models because there are many techniques that can be adopted here. And the most common are the Bayesian information criteria and the Akaiki information criteria. 
which is defined by this equation here. And we applied different techniques for uh, to, to, to choose this model order. But uh, for example, when we applied archaic information criteria, we noted that uh, this criteria did not present a convergence. Then it was re really hard to define a model order using archaic. Then we decided to apply the Bayesian information criterion, which is defined here, which presented a better uh, convergence for a, a unique value of the model order. And, but it's not a, a unique solution because, for example, if you change the, the model order, um, your model will be able to capture well the, your signal. But there, if you does not change so much your model order, um, the, me the methodology works as well. Then it's not so affected by the number uh, of the coefficients after after some after some minimal number, for example, mm -hmm. uh, then this is really it's a, a big problem when you work with autoregressive models. And in these parts, uh, we worked with Professor Eloy Figueiredo also, which has been working with autoregressive model for, for example, bridge uh, damage de de detection bridge. Then uh, he shared the. Uh, his knowledge about that with us, and he present, for example, the Bayesian information criteria. He said that he faced the same problems to define the, the model world. Then, it, then yes. after that, that discussion, we, we achieved that the Bayesian information criteria was the best, uh, best technique to define the model order in the case of the long wave propagation signals. For example, if we, uh, we we use the vibration data here. Maybe archaic criteria should present a better convergence. Mm -hmm. it, okay. it, it depends. Hey, Chien, uh, I, I, I do have a comment on this one. Uh, I read it, and uh, it was kind of because I, I'm not familiar with the uh, you know the Gaussian regression. So uh, my question to you, I mean, just getting in the same in the same way, same path and save some time. Uh, is it possible not to have a conversion? What do you do? Uh, so, sorry, Professor. Uh, I mean, define the hearing. order. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, the connection is a little bit unstable. Uh, okay, I'll try again. You repeat, Are you guys, can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. Can yes. you hear me? Yeah. I hope, I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, so again, you're talking about the the Bayesian and the Akaiki, uh, you know, uh, information, right? And 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 you said that the Bayesian it's it's likely to converge better than the Akaiki. And, and my question to you is, I guess, is is it important to define the order or your you know your 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 Gaussian uh, approach and and. Uh, if the, if both of this this uh, uh, approach they, they did not converge, so which order order you decide to use? Uh, uh, I mean, do do you understand my question? Yes, um, yeah, it, it's an interesting question. And for this, uh, there we propose, for example, uh, to evaluate. Uh, the the AR model identification using the witness test because even by choosing the for example a model order using Akaic or Bayesian we could there are some cases that you can uh, you can have an order that it's not feasible and we have we have no guarantee then we performed for each AR model identifies we performed the witness test validation to identify oh. if the the residual errors was really uh, white noise using the autocorrelation function. Like that, we could uh, confirm that the AR model was adequately identified. All right. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. It, 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 uh, yeah. Yes, you, you could use in another ways to perform this. For example, a uh, stabilization diagram, because we are trying to identify a transfer function. 
So if you analyze the, 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 a map of uh, Argan Gauss plan, for example, to see the poles in zeros of the function, we can try to define it is physically this, this correspond or not of a, of a possible model. So there might, but it's a, a, a difficult question to, to, to do. Uh, first of all, we don't have no idea that this, this is a linear system. So we, we don't know, we're trying to approximate with a linear model. So that's not to, to do that it's a uh, it's identified model. It's not correspond to that this is a correct uh, uh, way to describe the dynamic of this system. But this, I don't think uh, to do in this way. Yes, yes, very good. Actually, very, very good answer to it. Um, and it's, it's a well-known problem in our, in our, I mean, a, a bit, I wouldn't call it problem, like a, a challenge in autoregressive models. Um, um, okay. Um, then uh, my next question will be when we focus now in Gaussian process regression. Uh, you know, as you explained very well, you just simplify, you just simplify your, your model by uh, fixing the mean to be zero. And then you wanted to, <clears throat> to have a, a covariant matrix, which will give you the relationship between the different parameters. In the literature, there are many, many ways of estimating this uh, covariant matrix. And I see that in your work, you were using the exponential kernel. Yeah. Um, why this one and others? Is there any explanation or something that you find out yeah, yeah. We, we found out that this kernel works well for smooth uh, for functions with smooth trends into the literature. Then uh, we tried to at first use this kind of kernel, and we tested other kinds of kernel also, and we find out that this one performs better. But this is a difficult, difficult question because it's an open question to the literature: how to select the the optimal kernel function. Actually, this is most of the work. This is done by try, try, trial and error. You try to you select a, a kernel and you see if this kernel will be able to to capture to to uh, to describe your distribution. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. It's actually uh, an open question. You are you are right on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mainly in autoregressive model. Uh, for example, we use the UK Lab framework, and they have some papers published in this area. For example, uh, with some methodology to select the kernel, but it's not. Uh, it, as I said, it's an open question yet. Yes. Yes. Very good. Very good. Uh, <laughs> the last the last question in terms of the methodology uh, itself uh, you come up with uh, you know try to combine all the damage indices generated in the wind turbine blade mm -hmm. uh, which normally were computed sensor by sensor and yeah. you try to make like a global damage index but by averaging uh, yeah. the damage indices for for the case uh, mm -hmm. Did you see any implication on that? Did you find any challenge doing that? Uh, for instance, mm -hmm. damage and in the six in a very large structures can differ a lot yeah. uh, from the tip to the root, for instance. So I don't know. Yeah, th this is a very good question. In the paper that we submitted with the coupons, and we did the same. Um, uh, data fusion using just the averaging, we, we are questioned about that. And we tested different data fusion techniques. But the, um, the point here is we could adopt another technique for data fusion. For example, we could uh, use uh, uh, a weighted mean, for example, using uh, in order to improve the uh, this da data fusion, right? Because the, the averaging seems so simple at the beginning. But the point here is that, uh, for example, 
the damage in the, the damage indices in this uh, in this case I will, I will show the damage index of the wind turbine blade uh, they are well correlated for example with the the position of the sensor and for example uh, in most of all cases there there are some sensors that performs better than they present a uh, much higher damage index than others. Uh, for example, in this case, sensor seven and eight. And then we, when we do the average of this damage index, uh, there, there are some nature, uh, how can I say that? There are some natural weight for each um, the sensor. Even if, if you do not uh, put any weight for each sensor, uh, there is a natural weight of its damage index because there are some uh, sensors that are more sensitive to the damage. Then we performed, for example, the uh, data fusion with, with using uh, weight and averaging by using the correlation uh, with the damage as a weighting factor. Uh, as a weighting factor. Uh, but we, we, see, we could see that this result was similar because because of that, there is a natural um, weight with the damage index. For example, in the case of uh, of the coupon, as I said, uh, for the uh, paths crossing the damage, the the pattern or the damage index is much more pronounced when compared with the uh, paths not crossing the damage. Then when they do the averaging. Uh, the most relevant uh, paths will be just the paths crossing crossing the damaged region. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, then uh, uh, just one last question, and I will give a space to to Carlos to comment uh, and things. Uh, can you can you go to the <clears throat> one of the plots where you compute the error, the root mean square error, for instance, for any, that doesn't matter which one. Mm. Yes, for yeah. instance, this one. So the, the figure A here, for instance, uh, yeah. ideal case will be to have a cluster of points which are all together lying on the uh, dust line, isn't it? Yeah. That will be yeah. perfect. Yes. yes. However, yes. we can see that uh, they disperse a lot. Uh, yes. But uh, on top of it, we say it's uh, still good. But um, could could you comment on this a bit? How you can? I mean, this. I mean, this is nothing that you can improve here in this graph. This is a quantification of of this method. Yes. So, yes. The, the, there are some large deviation for some case, for example. Uh, if you analyze, for example, this estimation here, uh, mm -hmm. there is there is a large deviation here. But um, uh, if you look at the distribution, uh, it's closer to the diagonal line. And we okay. compare we compared also at the beginning when we obtained these results, we comp uh, we found out that the error could be. Um, uh, so so high. Then we compared with some other works in the literature, and found out that it's not so. It's similar. Um, it, it, okay. For example, you have some. Uh, we agree that we have some large errors here. For example, in this case, uh, for example, uh, the measured signal here were. Uh, I will try to, to estimate almost three dot two, and here we estimated has uh, four dot five uh, person. Mm -hmm. It's it's a large variation, but it can for some conditions they it it is improved. It's closer than I think that yes. this is caused this is caused also because of the. Small pop, small number of population used yes. for training. It could be improved, but if you think that that um, you you have nothing when you start to monitor a structure, we we don't know uh, information about the damage severed. Uh, 
it, it could be an interesting estimation, even with uh, uh, T0, that is not so large. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 I agree. Yes, that's a, a recommendation maybe that you can maybe consider to, to include mm -hmm. is that, uh, you know, when you compare figure A and figure B, it's clearly that the figure A, all the points cluster more together and they move away from the diagonal in some aspects, but from the figure A, they are very, very dispersed and you are totally right. Maybe the mean of this dispersion is actually very close to to the diagonal line. And in that case, yeah. it means that it has variability, but the mean is close yeah. to it. So maybe it would be a good idea to, to plot the mean of these things on top to make sure that that we, uh, yeah. we can see that. Because, you know, in, in I, this, I, Particularly I mean, in this, particularly in this particular one that you are selecting with your mouse, it can be argued that is good or bad because one stream is touching the line, another stream is far away from the line. But however, if you just put the mean of that, it might happen visually that you are actually very close to the line, even though it yeah. are dispersed. It's just a suggestion, but again, it's nothing major. Yeah, uh, your thesis. I agree with you, David. I think uh, I guess that uh, we uh, need we demand to find uh, another way to plot this figure, this this graph. I think it's better to show that there is a difference, but it's not a large difference. If you if exactly, you I think uh, we could uh, try to see another ways to plot to, to, to Maybe see. using a box plot or yes, for instance. Maybe box plot may be interesting on another another kind of plot. Yeah. Yes. I think it's difficult to try to find a, a good way to show a result in a plot. To if you change the type of plot. You can change it completely the the point of view to understand the where your results. But it's uh, I agree. Thank you very much for these comments. That's nice. Maybe you can look into this uh, area under the core for things like that. Like it's very using data driven techniques uh, to quantify that because you are basically are comparing what you measure with what you estimate. So you can actually see how. Well, it is. So it's like it's called rock curve and uh, AUK curve, which is under under the curve. But yeah, I okay. mean, it's something to highlight the potential of this method, which I think has has a lot of potential, and we would like to help you to 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 have a huge impact with your MST thesis. But that's it. So I think I, I will stop here, and I will uh, uh, give the word to Carlos uh, if he he have some comments to it. But thank you very much, Jose was really oh, good. Thank you, Professor Diz, for all the comments. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. David. We notate all comments and suggestions to be considered in the final version of the work. Now, I would like to invite Professor Simini to uh, discuss your opinions about the work of Jesse. I think he had some problem with the internet. Uh, He's not in the room anymore. I uh, don't see. That's true. He's not there. Yeah, uh, yeah, he's not uh, there. Not there. Uh, Maybe I will send a I, WhatsApp for him. Yeah. Just see. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so then, if you want, we can we can uh, <clears throat> carry on with that uh, because. Uh, you know, yes, you, you mentioned you finished your work talking about uh, it's because I'm very interested in this. It's my research field, so I really want to learn from you many, many aspects. So, uh, just, just as a discussion between colleagues, uh, you mentioned about as a future work to go for a free baseline model, uh, right? Yeah. So, how, how do you how do you see that happen? Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> I did. Uh, I did an internship with Professor uh, Guy Park, and he proposed some years late, uh, some years ago, uh, relative free baseline technique. It, we, we found out that it's very interesting um, because in this technique you compare, uh, for example, uh, your feature. You compare not with the reference uh, with the reference condition, but 
uh, the feature extracted from the other sensor, from another sensor. Uh, okay. And when you do that, you reduce, uh, you can reduce the effects of, for example, of the temperature variation. And in, in the case of the coupons, uh, the operational conditions variation, because on, on the data set of the provided by NASA, we have uh, data, for example, for the coupon when they are under stress, mm -hmm. they are under uh, loading condition. And our object objective here uh, is also to, for example, to include these conditions in the train of the GPR model and predict in both in both conditions, for example, under no stress and under stress. But for this, we found out that the effects of the load variation, it's uh, it's so important. Then we cannot train the same model and using both conditions. We have to reduce the effects of the operational variations. Uh, then we are studying the application of the relative free baseline uh, damage incidents. It could be interesting, yes. for example, for the case of the wind turbine also. Yes, this, this is why this is why <laughs> I'm asking this, because uh, we are facing this problem. And actually, the thing we are actually doing is try to try to monitor or to model our features depending on the weather mm -hmm. condition and then learn the relationships and, and mm -hmm. subtract it somehow. But again, it's good, this but is it's also tedious and depend on the case and depend on the data. So it will be good to have more a more universal uh, scenario, you know, but it's good. Yeah, uh, very yeah. good. OK, yeah. OK. We think uh, uh, we talked to Jesse about some ideas. Uh, Jesse suggested uh, me to try to use with your data in the in the wine turbine uh, the use of transmissibility functions to, to perform this. We think uh, using transmissibility functions, we can try to perform something uh, without baseline, without using baseline to detect the damage. It's a possibility yeah. to investigate this. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was, when you say about comparing sensors, I was thinking about transmissibility. Um, but it's, it's challenging as well. Um, the thing, yeah, but I, I agree. I agree. I agree. That can be one one option to see what happened into that. But, yeah, but I, I think one idea is to try to construct the transmissibility, consider the interval of confidence, for example, mm -hmm. using a Monte Carlo or semi PCE polynomial cause expansion mm -hmm. to perform this, it, to apply a better robust uh, hypothesis tests to perform the the existence or not the damage to try to reduce the false alarms, okay? Yes. Because the problem is the false alarms when you will not use a, a baseline. That's one one question. But I think we need to investigate this this idea. Unfortunately, Jesse, he is uh, make the PAG uh, in France, but not directly yeah. in structural health monitoring, in SHM. Yeah. So the SHM community, uh, lost uh, uh, a soldier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's true. So we're gonna go to France, you say? Yeah, I will okay. do a PSP there. I, I will work Perfect. there with, more with the modeling. It's must, uh, more with the model analysis and, but it could be used, for example, for SHM also. Uh, okay, very good. Congratulations. Thank you. That's nice. That's nice. So, well, thank I'm, you. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry for us because yeah, <laughs> you all did a good job. But anyway, okay, I will, I will then be quiet and leave Carlos to carry on with some questions. <laughs> okay, but thank you, thank you for your comments. So that's nice. Now I invite uh, Professor Simini to discuss uh, your opinions about the work of Jose. Okay. Thank you very much for your participation. Carlos. Oh. 
Uh, I think it's I think, out. Yeah. Let me turn that to. It's not working. I send a WhatsApp. Hold on. Hold, yeah, hold your horses. Hold your horses. I'll be. I'll be oh. in the other room. Okay. Okay. Hold your okay. horses. Okay. Okay. Hold okay. your horse. Uh, I don't have a good connection here. So I'll try to go to another room. Ah, okay. Let's see if it gets better right now. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now you can hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Just put plug my my power in, okay? Okay. <clears throat> okay. Now I I think I I can go on uh, without interruption. Uh, I was in the room that kind of you know it's shadow by the, the internet connection. So thank you so much for having me back. Uh, your work uh, has improved a lot since we, we last talked in the beginning of the year in the qualification, uh, right? And uh, most of the, you know, the suggestions are there. So mm. I'm glad that uh, you got a, a nice piece of work and a nice report as well, uh, because this is a design for you to develop a research from now on. And uh, actually, uh, you, you guys already published a lot, you published in the conferences, so the work has been criticized, has been evaluated, and uh, I have no comments on that, because it's a nice quality piece of work, okay? So I, I would like to say that, at the first to step up the baseline because all my comments from now on is trying to get your work better okay it's a criticism that's supposed to have you improve it so that's 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 my 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 role here uh i'd like to start uh, again I, I don't know if a comment to you guys uh but uh, uh david brought back the the issue of uh, smart structures, right? I remember when I was like, you know, 30 years ago in the, my PhD and then the Professor Chang started to work on this area, uh, there was a lot of, of uh, skepticism from the other professors from Stanford and the composites group. And mm. they are still skeptical <laughs> because 30 years later, we still, I mean, it's supposed to be a matured uh, technology, but it's still there's no like real, uh, I mean, a standard or a better case application in the real world. That's the very difficult to come up from our lab conditions, our you know, uh, nice behavior modeling conditions to something that's really applicable in the industry, right. Yeah. Uh, it's not it's not a problem of uh, you know uh, uh, lack of, you know study or lack of work. The problem is this is a damn difficult task. SHM is not something very very easy. It's something real real difficult. And I I think it's it's going to be another ten years you know uh, uh, before it, it goes. It, it, I know really in the in the real world to if it, at least to you know to to help engineers to make decisions and operational people and actually save money in the end which is the, the purpose of it right yeah so with that comment uh my first question to you is like can your approach you believe your approach can be applied uh, real time to monitor structures. I mean, mm. I'm talking about the the time that that you need to you know perform all the computational work. So this 
time can be used as a real time, for instance, if you use your methodology to apply to a real structure. Time wise, how, how do you how do you think uh, oh. it, it, it performs? Okay, Th thanks, Professor, for the comments. And uh, I, I will show I show here. I think that the methodologies uh, could be applied in the real in real time uh, because I thought the GPR model regression training is computationally expensive. Uh, the idea of the methodology is to be trained into offline mode. I, I put that on the dissertation, but I didn't mention it here. Uh, the idea is to use data from obtained from uh, laboratory conditions, for example, for train, training. And after that, this step is very simple to be implemented because the AR model identification uh, is very simple to be performed into, for example, a, a hardware. And this is one of the advantages pointed out in the literature to use, for example, autoregressive model. And also the damage feature and the damage index computing is very simple. And once we have the GPR model training, uh, to estimate the delamination size, we have just to um, give an input and do some simple math here. Uh, the problem here to imp implement it into a real case, in my opinion, is the because when you try to do that in a real case, you don't have controllable conditions, and it could be quite affected by temperature variation and operational conditions. This this is the big problem, not not from on for for this methodology, but. Um, Almost all SHM methodologies present this problem. How to uh, prevent these well, effects on? Well, well, I mean, uh, you can always use a methodology also to capture the temperature effect, right? Yeah. You can do that in lab as well. I, I don't see any problem with that. My main problem is that all the training data that you have and all the, the data that you're using to, to actually uh, calibrate your system is data in the lab conditions. So my point is, let's say that you have like a big blade, like a 30 meter blade, you're gonna be installed. Mm. Well, the first thing you have to do is to collect the signature of this blade, right? Because yes. the signature of this blade is not the same signature of other blade that was made two days later. They're yeah. quite different, Yeah. right? So the, the first problem is that you have to collect, you have to distribute. No, the first problem, I guess, is like, because in the lab conditions, for instance, I'm, I'm talking, I'm thinking about the blade, right? Because the blade yeah. is, is something that's, it's the, I think it's the first candidate to have a real SHM system to mount, to be mounted. Because yeah. wings are, are controlled by, you know, uh, certification agencies. They, they are not allowing the, them to fly. That Professor Cheng has like a salad for years. And I think they have one system that's flying in a, you know, a, a Learjet, I think, which mm. is something that's not really, you know, can, can be used as, as something maybe in the military, but, but not for civil applications. But let's say the blade, Let, let's start the blade, right? So you need, first of the first thing that you have to do is um, uh, actuators and sensors in your data collection. The actuators are shakers and the sensors are accelerometers. The first thing you have to think about is like, can you change this for PZTs? Can mm. you can you use like PZTs to actuate and, and as actual sense and then get the signals into your system and have nice results? I mean, that's that's a kind of a conceptual question. Do you think so? Yeah, I, I think I think so. In this case, it was for a real time monitoring should be the use of PZT uh, because, for example, you could embed the PZT into the compost also. Um, yes, but yeah, I, I'm thinking about the blade because the blade was yeah. accelerometers, right, and the shakers, right? 
Yeah. So so that's quite different excitation than than the PZT. But anyway, let's say that you can put a a, a, a network of actuators and sensors in a blade. Then you read it, and 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 actually you have to have the blade, and train the All damage right. in the blade for that specific blade. So yeah. it's not really practical, you see. Even yeah. if you have to overcome all these issues, something right. has to be done to model the structure and get rid of the, the signature, the baseline, yeah. for real structures. And this is, is a point that people are trying to do this a long, long, long time ago, but nobody can actually simulate this. Yeah. There's a lot of effort to simulate PZTs in a finite limit methods, and the propagation of the waves. We try to do that, but it's quite, quite difficult. It's very uh, yeah. different uh, mm -hmm. because of, uh, you know, damping conditions of the structure and things that you cannot, you know. Yeah. It's really hard. In, in, my, in my opinion, th there is some path that Professor Fuku Cheng proposed some years ago that could uh, could address this, this problem. Uh, for example, uh, in this case uh, of the coupons uh, here, he did it using PZTs. And the idea here was he trained the, the, uh, the idea here was to use uh, this uh, coupon for training, but the idea is to train the patch. It's the framework, for example, this is a, uh, a uh, compact coupon. Then the idea here is to calibrate, for example, a uh, definite framework with a uh, definite di distance between the sensors and the finite distance between the actuators. Like that, the idea here is to uh, learn in this structure into the lab. And for example, if you have now a, a wind turbine blade, uh, we will use the same the same framework, the same. Um, uh, the same structure with the, the same uh, dim dimensions, and we can monitor. Uh, we cannot monitor the entire, for example, the entire wind turbine blade, but we can monitor uh, some uh, hot, spot. Region, hot spot region. Then we can use the calibration uh, from this, for example, from this coupon for a wind turbine blade. For me, this is a very interesting. A way to okay. address this problem. And but, but anyway, you still have to have the baseline. You still have to have the signature. Yeah. Right? But I mean, if you do this, let's say that this is a carbon quasi isotropic laminate. Yes. Yeah. You build this, I don't know, in the autoclave or whatever, the same process that the wind blade that was made. But once you made the blade, the same coupon is going to have, I mean, let, let's go into that because I have some questions for you in that, that, that sense as well. Okay, I, I like your answer and, uh, and uh, it's just trying to put in perspective what are the difficulties that we have yeah. to face in the near future. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to go quickly on, the, on, the, on, the, on your document, but the thing is, uh, one thing that, uh, that I saw here at... I'm gonna get you there, but uh, the questions, the objectives are okay, really nice. Uh, I mean, your, your document, the report is really well written. I don't have any problem with that. Uh, and uh, one thing that you mentioned, and uh, it comes to me again. I don't know if you respond that in the in the qualification, but so I, I'm gonna ask the question again. You said that uh, you, you're using the, you know, the MSD with the uh, Mahalanobi square distance to identify the delamination detection level. And they use the GPR, which means this Gaussian process regression, to model and estimate the delamination size, okay? So the first one, uh, which is the to select an outlier, basically what you're doing, right? Yeah. You select an outlier, and and and, and this outlier means that uh, you're not detecting the point or the location of the of the the, the, the defect. 
It's just saying that there is a defect there. Yes. There is a discrepancy between the baseline and the, what we're reading now, and there's a defect. So this is just like a, 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 a interrupter, on off, right? Yes, yes. So it's on, you go ahead. If it's off, that's fine, that's no problem. Okay, so, so I understood well. Uh, and then you measure the signal from the lamp wave propagation and compare to the baseline. I mean, you present some graphs here and I'm not so sure what actually you did measure because sometimes you are in the, um, in the time domain and sometimes you are in the frequency domain. So what actually you measure? Measure the amplitude, right? Uh, uh, of the signal. In the case Mini of the volts. Ah, yeah. Any 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 data. The yeah. data that comes to you is like a, a bunch of data, and then you have you plot the, the amplitude, right? Yes, yes. The amplitude. Yes, exactly. So amplitude it, it, it's it's is the is there your your it, actual uh comparison parameter. Uh, not 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 the amplitude. In fact, it's the what we use to compare. Uh, it, it's the it's the coefficients of the AR, it's the AR model identified. Um, for example, right, but you identify the model with the amplitude. There is a slide that you you show that what two two waves. Right, this, this slide. This not one. this one. This one is good. This one is good. Yeah. This, so this, this one, you say that's a healthy one, and the damage. And there's a damaged one. Yes. And clearly, the amplitude is lower. Ah. So yes. that that's what you that's what you I mean to obtain the parameters. You, you're actually dealing with the amplitude, right? Yes. So there's some kind of damping in the material that reduces the amplitude. And then you say, oh, there's a problem there. There's a delimination there. Yes. Right. Yes. And delimination yes. is a real problem. But I mean, that's the only one problem. There's other problems as well. Not only the delimination, but delimination, I mean, it's it's the main interest of the industry. Okay. So that's fine. Oh, okay, no problem with that. So just make sure that I got the, the right things. Uh, okay. And then in your model. Uh, let me see here. Okay. And then you go to slide 22. Can you go there? I had a problem with this slide in your, in your, this in one? your 22. This, this one. I have a problem with this slide because I, I quite don't understand. You, you are plotting different states of damage. Is that right? Uh, this is like 22. Different stages of damage. One, yes. two, three, four. The damage is growing, right? Yes, yes. And then you put a top coefficient, a top like index, index, index that says that it's the temperature. And the uh, temperature yes. goes to 0, 10, 30, 40, 60, 50, 60. So yes. this is state that you're showing there is for 30 degrees, right? Yes. So, why is that a T over there? It's not supposed to be 30? Uh, yes, but this is because... Because when you put a T there, I think that's like... I don't know. I don't know what, I th what you think. It, it, <laughs> you know? This it, is it, just one state of damage for one temperature, right? You can plot like there's there's a very few temperatures like one two three four five six seven level. Yeah, it, this Mostly. is because because it, uh, in the health condition when the structure is health, we 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 did this temperature variation between zero and sixty in order to uh, to compare the effects caused by the temperature and the temperatures caused by the damage, but. This was performed just into the health condition. This is demonstrated here in this figure. So why 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 all the indexes have uh, different temperatures on the top? Go back to that slide. I, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to understand. Yeah. 
So so let's uh, let's see if I if I got it because the first yeah, time I didn't and now I'm still I'm still confused. So if uh, you go back there, you said that uh, for instance that can you go back there? Yeah. Twenty two. That's yes. that's right. That's the damage evolution for the thirty degrees, right? Yes. So if you have a zero degree, it's going to be another, a set of numbers, different numbers, right? Yes. So why don't you put a table with all the temperatures and all the damage, as you did for the next case, uh, is like 25. Actually, it's like 25 is not different temperatures, different specimens, right? Yes. Do you understand what I mean? Yes, yes. Okay, okay, then. I, I can change that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and let's, let's say, I mean, let's let next one is this one. Okay, uh, that's fine. Uh, in this one there, you do have four different coupons, right? right. And the results are plotted in nine, nine levels of damage. So somehow you're increasing the damage until the D9, right? And actually yes. putting some putty there, right? Some mass. Uh, in this case, in this case, in this case it's, yeah. the real it's real damage. It's real damage. It's real damage. By fatigue. So somebody go to the lab, cycle this thing, yes. take it off, measure or measure in, in the stage, and then go 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 further further until the rupture, right? Yes. Why? I mean, this this like uh, you know those uh, levels D nine. Some of the specimens they don't have uh, yeah. the damage at that point. It's because they fail already. Yeah, they fail okay. already. Okay. Um, okay. And another question in this slide: uh, the signatures that you have in the health conditions. You, uh, the guy who who work, work this 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 experiment, he did one for each coupon, or he did one for one coupon and then take it over for all of them because they're the same. Yeah. He did one for each coupon, and okay. yeah, it's it's interesting. Note that it's different for each coupon because there is some uh, variation to the procedure of fabrication. Sure, sure, yeah. yes. That's that's my point. When it, when I talk about the the signature, it's so difficult to get yeah. signature in the real structures. Yeah. Uh, so uh, and then you presented a graph that. Uh, you remember when I talked to you about, uh, you know, the convergence, the order of the model? You showed a slide that, uh, you know, it checked the the output signal and uh, and the autocorrelation. Mm, Do you have yes. the slide there? Yes. So this is nice, right? Because you you see that the the autocorrelation is just noise. It's like really really small. But if you go into your figure sixteen. Uh, which is, let me see here, uh, is that one that has the, you know, the application of case one, uh, trainee data and test data. Go ahead, more, more, more. Yeah. Here's one, here's one. Okay, so you plotted the actual, you know, uh average that that you 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 defined you train the data we train the system with the with the blue data and the the, the red data is the experimental data right yeah that, that's the, okay yeah. And, and and you put it uh three standard deviation uh to to you know to delimitate the the, the upper, upper bound and lower bound right yes so this this comprises almost like 100 percent of the data right it's 97 99.7 of the percent of the yeah uh if, you, if it's a normal distribution right yes. but if you look in the scatter if you look at because you you in the in the in the abscess you're plotting the damage the global damage and then in the ordinate, you're plotting uh, the local damage, right? Yes, right. So, uh, why it's 
in that case, it's like uh, the, the, the scatter is about one. It goes from minus half to plus half, if you look at the, at the you know, mm, and the, yeah. the, right? And follows yeah. all, all the way the picture. And then you, you have that, this is for the case one, which is the, you know, the blade, blade the, yeah. everything nice. And go to yeah. the next one that you have like the four specimens. Do you do yeah. you present that? I think so. I Go to the next. Right. That yes. that's the one. Yeah, and then you see that things are not really you know, because here you claim that uh, there are different structures, and you're trying to to do the same thing with different structures, which is fine. Yeah. Uh, but then here you 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 see that the the scatter is about four. Yes. Right. Minus yes. two to plus two, roughly. Yes. And the biggest data that you have is like, you know, uh, eight. Yes. So your scatter is about half, 50%. Yes. Right? That is because of all those sensors that you have collect and collect everything into one single parameter, which is the global, right? Yeah. So, again, the, my question to you is like, you mentioned that in the presentation, and you mentioned that also in the text. Why didn't you use the local parameter instead of a global parameter? Uh, you mentioned that it's a lot of time, computer time uh, to, but I mean, computer time these days is not so big deal. Is, is that uh, the reason? Yeah. Yes, but also it's because uh, if you do for each sensor, we have one GPR model for each sensor, then it should be hard to define what sensor to use to um, to do this, to, to estimate the, the delamination wire. Well, by, by using a global... I don't know what it is. Um, I, I guess, I guess, which be the sensors that the denominations in the path, right? If yeah. you know, you told me that it, it, your 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 approach is like you know uh, beforehand where the delamination is. That yeah. that's the input for for your your code. So you have the input. You 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 don't need a, you don't even need to use other sensors. Yeah, the, the, you put the right sensor and collect the right sensor. For instance, in that case that you have the you know the the plate with a lot of sensors the first one and the the, the the first and the first in the back the top and the bottom those are the most sensitive sensors the other ones they're not just adding information that's not important to your system and actually using this information to identify the damage so i i don't know why you did this this global thing yeah this is very interesting because uh it should be much simpler to use just one sensor. Um, but in a recent paper of Professor Fuku Chang, uh, he did a similar uh, methodology, but using a deterministic function. And he demonstrated that has much uh, more sensor you use to do that, you, you can you, you have a more accurate prediction. In, in, the, in that paper, he used a deterministic function to do that. And yeah. he did not, and uh, yeah, yeah, I, I'd like to see the paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You reference that paper here in your pro in, in your in your in your, uh, in your dissertation. Uh, your paper is here. Uh, I mean, you can send me later. I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm very interested in that paper yeah, because yeah, yeah. for me, it's, it's hard to, to make sense. It, it's it's very recent. It was uh, published uh, last month. I I can send you. Wow. But and then, but then you have the idea before. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you might you might have something to say that global yeah, 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 yeah. damage is good enough than local damage. I I'm just a guess. Yeah. I assume that if you use the term sensors that's close enough to the delamination, uh, the blade is not really good because the blade has only some spots that they were, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, vibrated, right? That were uh, activated. But if you have, let's say, that blade 
if all the sensors, let's say that were not like, uh, you know, uh, acelerometers, they were PZTs. So if you buzz sensor close to the, to the damage and listen to the, the buzzing to the other sensors, you have a better, better chance to identify the, the damage better, right? I don't know, that's just a guess. What do you think? Uh, yeah. Uh, can, can you put the blade on? Can you yeah. put that, that blade on with the damage? With the damage? Uh, no, before. 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 That, that's the one. Let's say that if you buzz, uh, let's say that th these are not accelerometers and not like shakers. These are all a network of PZTs, okay? Okay. Let's say that, let's say that you buzz uh, the line of six and, and, and five and buzz the yeah. sensors. Yes. You, you get a better chance to, to identify the, the denomination, don't you? If you know the denomination, yeah. Marianne. Ah, yeah, yeah, yes. Do you know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> yes. But when you, when you use a network, I, I agree with you. But for example, in the case of the coupon, if you use, for example, just one, one path here, the be best path is between five and, and, and eight, right? But uh, when we, we have no guarantee of the, the way that the denomination will start, um, there are some well, variations. This, well, this you know problem. where the denomination is. Yes. If you but, know where it is. But the way that the denomination will propagate is different. Oh, oh, that's okay. That, that's yeah. another step. That's another step. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree with you. How the delamination propagates is another story. Yes. I agree. I agree. Okay. Uh, I'm finishing, okay? Okay. Uh, well, okay. it's very nice overall. It's a nice piece of work. I, I, I'm, I'm actually appalled that you did so much work for, for a dissertation, a master's dissertation. I mean, you finished this in two years, right? Yes. Yes. So it's a lot of work. I mean, you 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 are really. I mean, congratulations for you and Samuel. Uh, and the very last question that I that I I like to ask you uh, is: Let's say that you go to France and do your PhD nice, and then the, you know uh, Axiona from Spain hire you. To, to know to implement the structure health monitoring in those blades, right? So you yeah. get a nice job and then start there. And they yeah. say, and they say, ah, oh, I do have a nice system to, to monitor the blades. Would you, would you be ready to set to put the system on and put your name on the line? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you understand my question? Are you like really, really, really strong about? what you found and then the, the results you got and the, in moving forward. I mean, you, you think that this is a good thing that that could be like, be developed into a hopefully practical system? Uh, if I have a, a good time to develop that, I, I think that I can profit of, uh, I can, because now I know the problems that I could solve here. Uh, I think that I, I could present a, a system that works well for wind turbine blades. If they ask me to do that, one thing that I should do, it's, uh, as you said, it's very difficult to establish a reference condition. Then in this case, I would like not to use, for example, um, uh, a condition has reference, but the sensors, for example, I can use the wave propagation from this, um, from this uh, wave path uh, with this wave path. I can compare the two. Like that, I can eliminate the, the reference condition. This is one idea that I, I should do uh, to get a better system, because like that, I can uh, eliminate the effects of temperature variation of or uh, environment and operational um, factors. Um, okay. 
Well, yeah, yeah, it's a very good answer, and I, I like it. And uh, I hope that you go to PhD and don't forget the SHM because yeah. we need people to work on that. I mean, yeah. on the side note, there's an open call from Furnas. I don't know if you know somewhere. One of the things in the the call is safety of blades, mm. and they they're putting a lot of money on that. Uh, if you, if, I didn't, I didn't present any, 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 any project this time because they have some problems with the, my university uh, concerning, uh, uh, you know, royalties and uh, intellectual property. I cannot go because of my university, but it's an open call, and they are putting money on that kind of thing to monitor the blaze because in Brazil is a disaster. If you go to the, I mean, they don't say that in the in the lit, in, I mean, in the news, but uh, the companies of uh, you know uh, insurance companies, they're they're can getting bankrupt because the blades are failing so much here. They they buy blades from a, a design office in Europe. I think that's one or two in Europe, and the blades are not real. I mean, adapted for the Brazilian wind, uh, you know, region. So the blades are failing. There's a lot of problems in the field. I mean, big, big, huge problems. People in, in the Rio Grande do Norte are calling me all the time. And uh, this is a real problem. If you know in advance the behavior of the blade, then it should be really easy and it could, it could save a lot of money. So with that, I thank you so much. Uh, Jesse and Samuel and David as well the, for the comments and uh, I stop here and let's move forward. Thank you very okay. much, Professor Simini. Okay, thank you, Professor Simini, to, to your points that you're uh, discussing. Uh, we annotated all comments and suggestions to try to incorporate in the final version. There is an interesting point about uh, the idea to do a research and development within industry. We are discussing this with Furnas, with a possible P a, a project. There is a call open, but there is really complicated to discuss this about the, the, the industry here. For example, Furnas uh, both assist using digital Im images, okay? And we are trying to use the digital, uh, the DIC technique, digital image correlation. And that's the point that I discussed with you last week. We are not able to solve the problem that you put in the project. It's, in the it's call, impossible. The it's impo it's completely impossible. <laughs> the IC is impossible because the IC is yeah. on the yeah. top. You cannot There's, see what's behind it. It's very, very yeah, difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's one point. That's one point. For example, uh, another comment that you do that's interesting, I would like to, to do some light. For example, the use of a different data set, how to extrapolate this to a, another different structure. For example, there is a, a light about this given by a, a research group in United Kingdom, uh, in Sheffield University, using transfer learning. Okay, using oh. transfer learning, I think we could try to do this because the idea is to have some Features, some damage features computed in the health condition in a source structure, and you have a distribution, probability distribution. Uh, when you have another different a target, another different structure, we have another, uh, uh, another completely different uh, uh, probability density function of this index. The idea is to try to map, to try to remap it, uh, using algebra, linear algebra, to try to uh, reduce this difference between them using another space. That is, is the same idea. It's interesting mm -hmm. to see the difference that in, in the United Kingdom work in you in Brazil, we in Brazil works because there, there is a company that asked this to the university to do. There's a company that to pay to develop something to try to do this because the main idea, I, I have the monitoring in this wind farm, but I need to use the knowledge in another completely wind farm. How can I do this? Okay. <laughs> that is my point. Well, I mean, can, in my the, point of view, bra in Brazil, <laughs> Furnas tried to give money to do this kind of thing, because here it's completely different, the environmental 
uh, compare with you offshore structures in the in the Europe. In the Europe, uh, you have we need to go to foreigners. We need yeah. to go to foreigners <laughs> to get money from them. <laughs> yeah, we need to discuss with someone. The question here that I, I, I am here completely open with uh, colleagues. For example, I am sure that if you have this project here in, in Ilha Solteira with Furnas, I am sure that uh, Jesse decide to stay with us in Brazil and not to go to the France. I am sure about this, if you have a company to do it, because I, I know Jesse has a, a, a way to do a startup, to do something about this. They, they, they has this spirit in, in, inside there. Inside Which is him. very good. Yeah, that, that's on point. But here, the company, it's, it's, a, it's a point. We have a, a, a project that we submit with uh, Professor Garcia to Royal Society about this topic. But I, I think uh, we are we are start to in, in this trip to 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 get some some future we we we, we can so but um, uh, now my comments uh, for me <coughs> just was Samuel just one thing to contribute about this collaboration with companies one approach that we use here in the UK is actually this saying that look there are countries because for the field of wind energy we compare UK always with Denmark. Denmark is very advanced in wind energy. And we try to say, look, in Denmark, this is working. So let's go to kind of implement it in the UK weather or, or environment. So this kind of transferring knowledge from other places by having communal collaborations normally works. So I want to say with this that sometimes by having a very strong reference or kind of commitment from two countries to working one topic, it will help to the industry to kind of rethink the way of they are thinking currently and try to adjust to the actual international community so this maybe this kind of grants that we apply together can be like a good starting point you know to say of course something has happened differently in brazil compared with uk for instance let's go to investigate what but let's know to reinvent the wheel right so let's use technology which already exists and implement it in this environment. Maybe maybe the, the answer actually is to say, we need to create a new technology, perfect. But we can actually say that the one currently used in the UK is not valid, but we have a good reference point. But I think from the community of academia is clear, right? Because we start always comparing with the past and learning to the future, but industry, they want just yes, yeah. quick money. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. But anyway, yeah. sorry, yes, you can carry uh, on. That's okay. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's the point. So, so my point now, uh, for me, it was a pleasure to work with Jesse during these last two years of your master course. I guess he had the opportunity to start in a different research area with several open opportunities, using robust methods for dummy quantification involving certain analysis. Uh, it's important to say that during his journey, we also had the chance to interact in two international internships. First in Portugal with Professor Leif Figueiredo, and the second performed by three months in South Korea with Professor Gary Park. And we recently changed some ideas with Professor David Cavas that helped us in the example of application in the wide term. So, uh that it's important to say that the initial idea the key idea of this work it, it was using a uh, different set of methods it, during his master course uh, Jesse gave give uh, uh, gave us some new ideas so there is a lot of development that uh, in this work was given directly by ideas of Jesse, it's important to say because he, he, he I think he, he is a, a great. He will become a, a, a future, a, a great research, a great research engineer because he give it the, uh, new ideas and with criticism. So same when you develop a new point, develop a method. It's on. It's never uh, say that it's the better. He, he is 
propose a, a new thing, you propose a new, a, new, a new approach, and you know the drawbacks about this. This is an a, a important point, essential point that I, I like in a, in a research, in, a, in a people that to do research, know the weakness about the methods. So it's not to, to, to shadow this point. This point. It, it's a, I think it, it is a, it's a good characteristic, a good feature of your set. Uh, there are some technical comments that would like to discuss. To, from my point of view, I think the tech the levels damage size correctly is essential to define a more safe SHM method. I think it is one point. Another open point in my point of view is to try to understand the relationship between a damage index, and the level of severity. Because the level of severity is really complicated to do, because we cannot correlate it directly in a linear way uh, the damage size with the severity of damage. In some cases, uh, uh, a damage of small size have a level of severity in the, the structure. Uh, if if you compare, so this method is it, it's only local from from some spot. Uh, there's limited to do to do with this, but I, I think in the find of this work it's interesting because we have uh, uh, several points uh, uh, difference to, to to do. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Because uh, I think there is a, a, a frozen in, in, in image here. No. My first okay. screen. So uh, now I think I, I will. So now I close the stream and I request uh, Jesse to stop out of his session in the Google Meet because we discussed the final results and signed some documents. Return after this, just uh, I call you in the WhatsApp to return here. Okay. Okay. Oh, oh thank you very much for all the discussions. Okay, two minutes. We are right. I call you. I will drop the gravação.